Hey everyone, I'm Natalie from CMAC and we're back with another video on media literacy. In our first few videos, we defined media literacy and discussed why it's important for us to become critical thinkers about the media we interact with. Lisa showed us how to fact check sources and recognize bias. Johnny explained the responsibility of media creators to be mindful of the media messages we publish or post. And Kyle provided tips and tricks for ethically framing our media message when creating content. You can watch those videos anytime on our YouTube channel or on our website at cmac.tv slash media literacy. In this video, we're going to discuss media representations, what they are, what they are not, and why it matters. Let's dive in. Media representation can be defined as the ways in which people, places, objects, and social situations are portrayed within the media. Whether you're watching the news, a movie, a documentary, or a TV show, everything you see on screen is a representation. It's important to remember that these representations are carefully created by producers to convey a specific message to the audience. This message is also informed by the producer's own viewpoint, experiences, and intention. Media representations have the power to shape your knowledge and understanding of a topic, perhaps without you even realizing it. On a large scale, media representations can also influence society's ideas and attitudes on topics. In order to be critical thinkers and analyze the media messages we consume, it's helpful to understand some key terms. Construction. This is how a media message is put together. In film and TV, this includes writing, choice of camera angles, and editing. In print media, this would include writing, layouts, and choice of images. Mediation. This is the process the media message goes through before it reaches the audience. This can be how a film or TV script is written and rewritten before it makes it to production, or how photos in print are cropped or captioned, or even how real life events like a protest or a speech are portrayed in a news report. Selection. This refers to what has been selected to be included in a media message. This can be particularly important in news articles, where selecting certain facts over others can change the angle of a story. What is omitted can be just as important as what is included. Anchorage. These are words that go along with images to give specific meaning or context. Some examples are captions and headlines in news or taglines in a movie poster or in an advertisement. Stereotypes. These are simplified representations of a person, groups of people, or a place. They can be used to describe something quickly, relying on existing audience recognition. Stereotypes can be dangerous, as audiences over time can create generalizations about people or places. Ideology. These are ideals and beliefs held by media producers, which are often represented in their media messages. Everyone has bias, and everyone's own lived experiences inform the media messages they create. Let me give you a basic example to apply these concepts, a photo you might post on your Instagram page. Because yes, even social media posts are media messages. Say you're at the beach with your friends and you decide to take a photo to capture the experience. Before you take that photo, you have to decide what you want to include and what you do not want to include within the frame. Maybe you wanna show the waves or the skyline. Maybe there's a cool rock formation in the distance. Or maybe you wanna show your friends playing volleyball on the beach. Whatever you decide is up to you but those decisions are inspired by what you want your photo to say. Choosing to take a photo of your friends playing volleyball might read to your audience as a fun group vacation, whereas capturing the sunset with nothing but footprints on the shore could read as a quiet solo trip. By deciding what you want and don't want within the frame of your photo, you are deciding how you want your subject, in this case the beach, to be represented. In other words, the message you want to convey to your audience determines how you take that photo. Are you starting to see how the ideas of construction, mediation, and selection can come into play? Just as you decide what to leave in or omit from your photo, professional media producers decide what to keep and omit from their content as well. This is true for all forms of media, including movies, TV shows, and news broadcasts. Everything in the media is a representation of something, purposefully constructed to impose a desired meaning. This means that everything in the media is constructed. Because of this, it's important for us to understand that what we see represented on screen is not necessarily a true or accurate picture of reality. Stuart Hall, a British cultural theorist, argues in his theory of representation that media representations are not reflections of things that already have meaning. Instead, the media representation is what creates the meaning in the first place. 
Hall explains that because there are so many ways to represent something in the media, there is no one meaning or true meaning of the thing being represented. Instead, media producers create meaning by how they choose to represent their subject. Just by the act of creating, the producer alters or distorts the representation. Let's take a look at another example I'm going to borrow from Simon Hunter, a media studies professor at Tavistock College in England, who explains media concepts on his YouTube channel, The Media Insider. I have a question for you. Which of these two representations of Donald Trump do you think is most accurate? Well, it's actually a flawed question because it implies that there's one correct meaning to Trump and everything associated with him. What's more interesting is who came up with these representations and why. This is the basis for Stuart Hall's representation theory. We've got the man in reality with his actual meaning, and then we have the media's representations, which are almost like photocopies, and they're going to have varying degrees of accuracy or distortion. Well, Stuart Hall challenged this idea of representation completely. The problem with this approach, as Stuart Hall saw it, is that it implies the original subject has a single fixed meaning against which accuracy can be measured. But he points out that this can't be so. So here's Stuart Hall himself explaining that representation isn't an after occurrence, it's a constitutive one. Now we're talking about representation, not as an after the event activity. It means something and then the presentation might change or distort the meaning. We're talking about the fact that it has no fixed meaning, no real meaning in the obvious sense, until it has been represented. Media representations aren't reflections of things that already have meaning. They are the meaning makers of things that happen in reality. So how does the media construct meaning? This process takes place through the use of codes. In media studies, codes are visual, verbal, and auditory signs used to communicate key representational elements to the audience. An example of a visual code could be the way someone is dressed, such as wearing glasses to present them as nerdy or smart. A verbal code could be the language a character uses that presents them as intelligent, or an accent to articulate where they might be from. My kitchen! My dinner! <laughs> Country. Codes can also be the way the camera is positioned or the use of music to make a situation in a scene feel more intense. Tell me that I should, as the new preacher of this church, sacrifice myself so that y'all can have a share of the good meat tonight. The key thing to remember with codes is that they serve to communicate the producer's intended meaning, and in order to do that effectively, they must be accepted by the audience. It is this shared acceptance of a particular code that gives it more power and influence. Now, there's a lot to unpack when it comes to codes, and we'll dive more deeply into how they influence our worldview in our next video. But why should you care about media representations? Why does it matter? It matters because media messages are everywhere, and representations have the power to influence your knowledge and understanding of the world. If we aren't careful, it can be easy to believe distorted, constructed messages as reality. Think about political or social issues that you have strong feelings about. Hall's theory says much of society's understanding of the world is based on meanings which have been created by media producers who have power, as they try to fix a meaning to a certain thing in the real world. Let's consider the idea of media hegemony. Hegemony on its own is defined as the power or dominance that one social group holds over others. Cultural hegemony is a means of manipulating the culture of a society in an effort to gain power. In media, hegemony takes the form of the owners and managers of media industries who control the media messages being created. James Lull explains this best in his essay titled Hegemony. He writes, owners and managers of media industries can produce and reproduce the content inflections, and tones of ideas favorable to them far more easily than any other social groups because they manage key socializing institutions, thereby guaranteeing their points of view are constantly and attractively cast into the public arena. Owners and managers of media companies heavily influence the content being created. Currently, there are only six major companies that own about 90% of all US media. Why is this bad? It's bad because it means the media representations we see are constructed narrowly in ways that promote specific viewpoints as the norm, thereby keeping those ideas in power and dominance. The only way to combat this is with a diversity of ideas and viewpoints. We can see how media representations are limited by looking at who's working behind the scenes. The 2021 State of Media report, published by The Representation Project, shows that men still dominate the media landscape, both on screen and behind the scenes. In 2020, only about 20% of major films were directed by women only 26% were written by women, and about 25% of the top films were written and directed by people of color. 
According to Darnell Hunt, Dean of Social Sciences at UCLA, real change won't happen until the racial makeup of the executive ranks changes. These executive positions remain dominated by white people. In a review of 11 major and mid-sized film studios in early 2020, Hunt and other researchers found that 91% of studio heads, 93% of senior executives, and 86% of unit heads are white. Hunt says this is where the real power lies where the decisions are made that affect everything else in film and TV media. You can find similar statistics for executive and leadership positions in other media industries like news, television, music, and advertising. Looking at these numbers, it's clear that the majority of what we see represented on screen was created by white men, which is not in and of itself a bad thing. White men should be allowed to create media and tell stories. The problem is, if all we see are constructions built by white men, we're only seeing representations through their perspective. So where does that leave the rest of us? This is why it is crucial for us as media consumers to be critical of the media we consume. Again, media is everywhere. We interact with and use media in almost every aspect of our lives, for entertainment, to learn new things, to be more productive at work, and more. We have to remember that media is a powerful communication tool. How we choose to use this tool is up to us. Understanding media representations is just one piece of the larger puzzle. For more resources on media literacy, be sure to check out cmac.tv slash media literacy. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you so much for watching. Mm -hmm.